2019 was an, another great year for games, with so many excellent releases that if I put everything on this list that I didn't think people will be still playing in 5 years, it would be a long list. As it is, I've trimmed it down to 7, as opposed to my usual number of 5. These are the games that stood out for this year for one reason or another, in order of release. Resident Evil 2's remake has been a long time coming, with 3's remake confirmed for sometime in April 2020. For a long time, Capcom said the cost and time was too much for them to handle, given the scope of the game. I think giving it a more modern, yet just as effective camera, rather than having to recreate the pre-rendered backgrounds of the original, was what changed things. It looked amazing, and while half the game is backtracking through the police station, there are enough changes while you play the game as Leon and Claire as each character twice with the final ending. I don't know how faithful as it is to the original, since I was a dumb kid playing on a friend's console at the time, and all I remember is getting Leon killed a lot, but I'm pretty sure there wasn't this much shooting needed in the original. Here you just can't do the classic weave move to run past zombies and most of the time, they'll just lurch onto you. I'd like to give them credit for adding bonus chapters and challenges and not charging it as DLC because that's the norm now. Next up is another Capcom game, Devil May Cry 5. The hype for this was almost tangible. While the story was a bit iffy and some late plot twists were obvious from the start, it's a Devil May Cry game. It might actually be the best story yet. The graphics were amazing, though as usual the scenery was somewhat reused a bit often and a lot of enemies were just reskins of older ones. That's par for the course though. You should know what you're getting into here and that's over the top combat. You use motorcycles as a weapon in this game. It's just fun action with difficulties ranging from don't see the cool parts to harder enemy variety and they all kill you in one hit. Speaking of hard games, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the latest release from From Software, the creators of Dark Souls. I've beaten Dark Souls 1, 3, and Bloodborne and this is on another level entirely. The wandering trash enemies that you can kill in one or two hits in the other games are serious threats. Plus they come at you in crowds and there are mid-bosses everywhere. It's more suited for stealth and platforming, with your prosthetic hand being a grappling hook among many other things. Like the fact that you can die and resurrect yourself mid-fight. It also has a functioning story while maintaining that item description hint mystique. おじいへのご前以来か。源一郎殿。私は。すまぬ。お任せを。Like the rest of the games, there's an overlaying decrepit beauty, something I've wanted to make a standalone video about for a while now. The world is war-torn and there are bodies everywhere, but there's still wonders to behold, particularly in nature. I haven't been able to get very far in it, but I've had a lot of fun and frustration. It's a single-player game though, so for once you can pause it. Control was a game I bought on a whim because I heard the name floating around a lot and there was a good deal on Amazon. 
I knew it was by Remedy, the same studio as Max Payne, Alan Wake, and Quantum Break, so I was sold, and that trust paid off. While the gameplay isn't 100% innovative, in fact there are some things that have been done before and after on this very list. It's mostly a third person shooter with a gun that changes form, so while you can only have a, technically two weapons equipped at a time, you just need to go through a few menus to switch to another. You also have some force-like powers. While there's pretty much nothing too new or surprising, they make the combat more, way more interesting. But the real draw here is the story, which is enigmatic and stylish, presented through half-redacted government files and visions pumped directly into your mind that translate with multiple meanings. The story is as much about figuring out what your goal is and what's going on as it is completing it. If it weren't for the, such interesting storytelling methods, as well as the story itself, it would end up in the, yeah, it's a shooting game, box. Astral Train is an action RPG emphasis on the action. Like most of Platinum Games, Bayonetta, The Wonderful One, Near Automata, and directed by Hideki Kamiya, the creator of Devil May Cry. It's focused on stylish fighting with a combo system that's as intricate as you make it. The main combat system revolves around a living weapon you control, and eventually you get more of throughout the game. It's almost an approach at an open world game. There are tons of side quests, your main character's clothes and accessories are customizable, and you spend time in the same areas which change over time. The story is middling, but some of the 11 chapters are more interesting than others, and there are definitely some of Platinum's too big equals better moments. I don't think there was any major game more divisive in the past decade than Death Stranding, with some reviewers giving it a 10 out of 10, and others a 35 out of 100. Some people thought it was a modern masterpiece that proved video games aren't just for violence, while others considered it a self-indulgent dumpster fire. And I'm not gonna lie, the first 15 hours had me in the latter category. I wanted to like this game, and by the time I got far enough in that I was rebuilding roads and disarming bombs, a common theme in Hideo Kojima's repertoire, you start off the world's most miserable UPS worker, but 35 hours in and it's actually a bit like Elite Dangerous. Take a job delivering cargo from one place to another, more than one if you can make the route and weight work, and rebuild the country as you do it. Rain, called Timefall, makes things age quickly so it damages your cargo, while you have to sneak your way past antimatter ghosts called BTs and attack or avoid mules, former porters who have lost all purpose in life other than to take cargo and deliver it to their own base. You connect to other real life players by leaving everything from signs, bridges, and building materials, all of which can be rewarded with legs, which basically function as your XP in this game. You connect to other real life players by leaving everything from signs, bridges, and building materials, all of which can be recorded with likes. The first time I finished building a road, I got a message saying 130,000 something people like that. I went up by like 80 levels. There is combat, but you have to play a significant amount of story fetch quests, which is what most of the game is, and even then it's scarce and hard. Using lethal weapons during the most of the game will trigger an antimatter explosion called a void out and get a game over, so most of your weapons are non-lethal. It's better to avoid combat altogether, especially since it'll likely damage your cargo. Death Stranding isn't a game for everyone. I understand why there are low reviews in Backlash videos, but if you embrace it for what it is, you can grow to like it. It's something that will at least be a cult hit and stay around for years. Which is good, because the worst possible thing that can happen for this game is for the multiplayer servers to get shut down. Finally, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. There have been a lot of games recently that tried to be, tried to be Dark Souls and not quite gotten the mark. Fallen Order tried to be a Star Wars game, missed the mark 70% of the time, and ended up being an easy Dark Souls game. It has all of the elements, parry-focused combat, lore drops being a narrative device, and rats that will murder you. Dying is a bit less punishing. The enemy that kills you keeps your XP and skill points a la Bloodborne, though unlike the Souls games, it will stay there no matter how many times you die, and all you need to do to get it back is hit that enemy once. It's a lot more forgiving in general, though there are a couple bosses that make soul bosses look easy. The world design is also reminiscent of Soul-type games with doors that open from the other side and shortcuts that change your life. 
It also has Metroidvania elements where you need to upgrade to get somewhere or use something and platforming is much more prevalent. In the end, I guess it's more like a combination of Sekiro and Uncharted, with a better version of Metroid Prime's map. Most of the story is, we have to go here because of the reasons, so it feels like it's our own universe, but... But the parts that are Star Wars are very Star Wars. They really get the themes down, and most of the characters' backstories are fleshed out. I'm pretty sure this is the only game where you fight Darth Vader that isn't a direct game based on the original trilogy. And obviously, he's a beast. I couldn't narrow this year down to 5 games, and that's kind of arbitrary anyway, so these are my top 7 games of 2019. Except for Death Stranding, which has a PC release sometime in 2020, and Astral Chain, which is a Switch exclusive. All of these games are out for everything non-Nintendo. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, share it to someone who might like it, and subscribe for more videos with this kind of analysis. I usually only do top 5 style videos at the beginning of the year, so I'll have a more focused style going forward. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around.